Okay, I have an indication that we're recording, so let's go ahead and get started. I've tried to crank the microphone up as loud as I can without getting feedback, so I hope that's going to work out. Um, welcome to the fourth lecture for CSE 142. Uh, the question of the day is still continuing to be popular. People are filling it out. And so for the most recent question, apparently more of you are interested in the future. So that's very interesting. Uh, so that was uh, the answer to our question three. The engagement TAs mentioned to me that there are uh, people submitting questions, which is great. So we're gonna start having some questions that have been submitted by students. Uh, there's information uh, under the engagement activities tab about that, including uh, a link where you can submit uh, a question. Uh, and then uh, basically, this is a description of an activity that's gonna be coming up on this Thursday from five to six. It's the first of our engagement activities. There's a description here that you get a tiny bit of credit if you're doing engagement activities. And the link to the, the Zoom link it's on the, uh, the, the, uh, this page I've set up that has the Zoom links. Uh, they asked us not to have the Zoom links on uh, a public page like this, so it's on a separate page where all the different Zoom links appear for the course. So if you're interested, uh, this Thursday will be the first of those uh, engagement activities. Uh, the description is here. Um, I thought I'd mention uh, one more time that uh, a lot of people are paying attention to this uh, research page here at the University of Washington. So it's a group of researchers who have uh, been doing predictions. They did a major update of their model yesterday. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, models uh, aren't necessarily predicting exactly what's gonna happen. Part of it is that things change over time. And uh, one of the things you notice in comparing what their model is showing today versus before is that things look a little bit better. Uh, you know, still not great, but they're predicting now uh, their baseline case is around 81,000 deaths in the United States. It's about twice as many people uh, as the number who died uh, in the flu season last year. So not good, but um, not, not as bad as some of the projections had been. And a, a particularly interesting thing is that if you uh, go to the prediction for Washington, they think that we're already uh, past our resource peak. So they think that we're on the, that kind of the downside of that slope where uh, things are gonna start uh, becoming less stressful for us. So uh, a lot of the discussion in these days is about New York and New Jersey and Michigan where there's uh, Louisiana, where there's a lot of um, new cases and, and clearly they're dealing with a very tough situation. Uh, we're, uh, it looks like, a few weeks ahead of them. And so the prediction here was that uh, we're actually uh, starting to, to be in that downward slope. Again, it's just a prediction. We don't know for sure how it's gonna turn out, but uh, that was a little bit um, of good news. I wanted to mention uh, a couple of things. So the message board is open for business. You can click on it here. Uh, there's also a link to it over here. The message board is a great place to ask questions about the homework. Um, there's a link here to Java software. Uh, uh, and uh, Jonathan Sanders is responsible for that. He's a course helper for us. Jonathan sent out a message to the class to let you know that uh, there was a glitch that some people were experiencing and he gave you a suggestion for a fix for it. If any of you are having trouble getting JGRASP and Java to run on your home computer, you can email Jonathan. Uh, his information uh, is... Uh, here, uh, this is the, this is the, uh, oh, actually, uh, that's not Jonathan's email address. It, well, he sent email to all of you uh, through the announce list. Uh, you know, our announcements also go up on a page in case you're interested. So uh, if for whatever reason you didn't uh, see Jonathan's message, it's right here about the JGRASP warning. Uh, and that has his email address in it. Um, I keep updating the calendar with new uh, things as they get posted. Something new is that the labs are going to start this week. So I've added more information about the labs here, uh, the, the CSE 190 labs. Uh, so I have a fairly long description here of the idea behind the labs, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But let me just say that this was something we added to the course 
as an optional extra thing for students who are, I mean, particularly for novices, you know, for people who uh, are really just starting out with all of this, it gives you an opportunity every Tuesday to practice some of the things that we've been discussing in lecture. Uh, and to practice things like using the JGRASP interactions pane. Later, we'll have you practice using the JGRASP debugger. So uh, the 190 lab is, uh, is uh, particularly oriented towards people who want a little extra help. So we're gonna do them through Zoom chats this quarter. There'll be a TA with a relatively small group of students. We'd ask you to work through the lab exercises. This was lab one that we didn't do last week because we, we weren't organized enough in time. There'll be a lab two that shows up uh, for tomorrow. That, that's what you'd work through is lab two uh, uh, for tomorrow if you sign up for the 190 lab. So if you're interested, you can sign up. The Zoom links are here uh, for those uh, that have been added at the end of this page the Zoom links for the 190 labs. Um, I, normally, we might let people attend something if they weren't registered, but we can't do that with the 190 labs this quarter. We, we can't overwhelm the TAs with too many students showing up. So you should really only be going to the 190 lab if you've registered for it. So um, I'm going to send out an email that probably will get to you before you watch this lecture. Uh, that reminds you that the labs uh, are open for registration, so you can go ahead and, and sign up for a lab if you're interested. Okay, I think that's enough general bookkeeping for now. Um, let me switch to JGRASP. Uh, so uh, we're going to be moving into some, uh, some of the later material from Chapter 2. I wanted to start with just one thing before we leave behind expressions and operators and so forth. Um, suppose we had an integer variable n that, I'll just kind of put a bunch of digits here for uh, an n. Uh, so suppose that this is a, a value that we're working with. I wanted to say a little bit more about this mod operator. Uh, it was the percent sign uh, mod operator. So I mentioned, for example, that if you said, what's 20 divided by 6? Java says, how many times does 6 go evenly into 20? And it goes three times, so the answer is going to be 3. But you know, three times six is 18, so, you know, but this was a 20. So what's left over? What's the remainder? What's unaccounted for? Well, it's two, right? You know, because the difference between 18 and 20 is two. So you didn't account for those last two, you know, a part of it. So if I do 20 mod six, it tells me that two. It tells me what was left over from that division computation. This operator turns out to be useful in a lot of different tasks. So I want to just mention a couple. Uh, and it's too bad, normally it's very interactive. I can ask people for suggestions and I usually get some good suggestions from the audience. Um, some of my friends have suggested that I should you know, wear a hand puppet or something and talk to the puppet. Uh, I reminded them that Mr. Garrison in, in South Park had Mr. Hand, you know, so I don't know whether that's a, a good argument for uh, using a puppet or, anyway, uh, I don't, it's probably not good for me to pretend uh, to, uh, to be a student. I'll just kind of try to make do without it. Uh, but one of the things that I uh, would ask people to think about is, what if you wanted to think about even versus odd, an even number versus an odd number? So you can see that this n is an even number because it ends in a 4. Well, what do we mean when we say that something's even or odd? Well, what we mean is that it divides evenly by 2, right? So if I do n slash 2, in this case, this half of what I had here, and there was nothing left over, nothing left over. That's kind of the key thing which means that n mod 2, what's left over from the computation, is 0. So that's going to be true for an even number. If I had an odd number like 13 and I modded it by 2, that does not divide evenly, and so we get a 1. So a 0 or a 1, depending upon whether it's even or odd. So that's kind of a useful thing to do. Uh, given our n here, uh, so another thing that you might want to think about is, how would you get the final digit of the number? How would you kind of pick off that last digit of the number? And so I kind of think of it as, well, you know, when you divide in base 10, it's like moving the decimal point over by one. So if I thought about n divided by 10, it's as if you move the decimal point over by one, and in this truncated division world, uh, it just lops off the point 0.4. So n divided by 10 gets you these leading digits of n, everything but the four that's at the end. And so that means that n mod 10 
it's going to get us the four. It's going to get us the, uh, the leftover, the, uh, the unaccounted for part that we get by doing the truncated division. So this is a useful set of expressions here, n divided by 10, n mod 10, a way of, of breaking a number apart into its leading digits and its final digit. So that's a very nice application of mod. And maybe I'll just mention one last thing, which is uh, just kind of a, a, a tip or a hint or whatever. You know, Stuart loves mod. Uh, is that uh, I was an undergrad math major, or so, and I uh, just I, I love all the things that you can do with mod. And so I often do examples. Uh, you know, you guys won't have it on exams, but you know there'll be a lot of examples. Uh, and it's not just me. You know, there's a lot of places where it's helpful to be able to do these kinds of things with mod. Okay. Well, so I wanted to do that first, uh, but now I want to switch to back to uh, this program that I have here. We can collapse this for now. So what does this program do? Oops, I'll scooch it up a little bit more. So this program prints out four lines that are fairly repetitive that tell you what the first four squares are. Uh, there's a comment here. We're going to get to doing that later. Uh, and then there's a print line that kind of says that's all, folks. So if I do compile and run, then I get those lines of output, you know, that tell you what one squared is and two squared, three squared, four squared, uh, and then there's the that's all, folks. So that's what the program does, which is fine. That's kind of the stuff we, we did, you know, in chapter one. Now that we're in chapter two, we're going to learn our first, what's known as a control structure. So a control structure is a statement that controls other statements. So we're going to see several of these as the quarter goes on. And the first one that we're going to see is something that's known as the for loop. So I want to do some typing here, some text typing. But, you know, I'm, I'm in a Java program, so I've got to be a little careful. There's a, a way to do a multi-line comment where I can kind of do this, these characters to open a multi-line comment and these characters to close a multi-line comment. So this is something that will let me just do some typing here. So what we're going to learn is something that's known as the for loop. So that's kind of the second half of chapter two, is it tells you about the for loop structure, which is one of these control structures. It is a statement, but it controls other statements. And let me just kind of type in the general form of it first. Uh, the for loop, uh, it's got, there's a lot that kind of gets packed into this header for the for loop. There's an initialization part, there's a test, and there's what we call an update. Uh, and then inside the for loop, there are some lines of code that we refer to as the body, and then there's a closed curly brace. So you notice we got these kind of the curly brace that we've been using, you know, to indicate grouping. So that's kind of grouping uh, the body. That's indicating what's part of the body of the for loop. Oops, and that's not, I didn't mean to spell it like that. Uh, an initialization, a test, and an update. Uh, and I think I'm going to just jump right in and uh, type in one of these for loops so that we can see what it does. So uh, I'm going to have the word for. Notice that JGrass put it in purple because it knows that's a Java keyword. So the first thing that goes in the for loop, an initialization. So I'm going to say that I want an integer variable i that I'm going to initialize to be 1. So that's my initialization part. After the initialization, there comes a semicolon. There really is a semicolon there in the middle of this for loop. And then a test. And the test I'm going to want to use is i less than or equal to 4. And then there's a semicolon. And then there's an update. And the update I want to do is an incrementing update that makes i one bigger. And I'm going to do that by saying i plus plus. That's going to be my update part. Then there's a right paren, you know, as you see here. And then there's going to be some curly braces. And then uh, inside those curly braces, I include whatever I want to have be the body of the for loop. So I'm going to take this print line here and tab to make that the body of the for loop. So uh, we're going to produce these lines of output with a loop rather than doing this kind of tedious thing where we're doing printlin, printlin, printlin. We're going to have it inside of a loop instead. So again, I can hover over the curly braces, and JGrass points out the begin, you know, with the corresponding other curly brace. So I can see that this is the body. This is what's inside of that for loop there. Uh, and I can see the other parts up here. Uh, this is, again, a syntax that's borrowed from all the way back to C in the 1970s that C did for loops this way, so did C++, and so Java decided to copy for loops in this way as well. So uh, 
let me kind of just briefly mention what it does, and then we're going to look at it uh, uh, in a little more uh, detail. So it's kind of saying that I want to introduce a variable i that gets initialized to 1. What I'm going to be testing on is seeing whether i is less than or equal to 4. What I'm going to be doing over and over again is printing this, and I'm going to be incrementing i by 1 every time in order to do some kind of an update. So let's do a compile here and an execute. And uh, we'll see that what we get is four lines of output, all of which say one squared is one. You know, I mean, it's, right, we're getting closer. It's good that it's, uh, that it's producing four lines of output. It's not good that it's all one squared is one. You know, we wanted two squared is two and three squared is, uh, two squared is four, three squared is nine, and so forth. So we want to uh, compute the different squares here as we go along. So this is normally the part in the lecture where I'd say, so how do we change it so that it's going to produce those different lines, you know, so that sometimes it does one squared, sometimes it does two squared and everything. And people can kind of see that there's this variable i involved that's starting at one and it's going up, you know, every time. And so people kind of have the idea that we don't want to be printing out one squared, we want to be printing out i squared. And we don't want to be printing out one over here, we want to be printing out i times i. And usually I get a student who will say something like, you know, instead of one, say I, or, you know, on the first one, then say I times I for the second one. And so I, I do the, I literally do what they said to do, which is kind of I replace the ones like this here. And almost everybody can see this isn't going to work. You know, uh, uh, this is just kind of having a string constant that's got I's in it now instead of ones. But uh, we'll just go ahead and compile and run and take a peek at it. So, you know, what it's doing is I squared is I times I four different times. So obviously that's not what we want. What we want here is not literally the character i, so we don't want that i to be included in the, in the string constant. What we want is the variable i, you know, that this Java variable i. We want to have its value being printed. Uh, different languages kind of have different conventions for printing. In some languages you can use commas where you can say print i and then print this and then print something else. So that might be a way of doing it. That's not how Java does it. In Java you can only print one thing. But you may remember from Friday's lecture that there's something called string concatenation. And so it's, that's one of the reasons that uh, string concatenation is so basic in Java is that you use it in order to be doing printing commands like this. So we can concatenate an i with squared in order to be able to get the i squared. So let's go ahead and compile and try running it and see what that does. And it gets me 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared. Again, we're getting closer. We're not quite there. Notice there's no space right here between the 1 you know, and the word squared. Well, so Java takes you very literally. It says you wanted to have the i, and then you wanted to have this s here, and you didn't tell me to put a space anywhere. So if you want a space, you'd have to put a space right there that you meant to say i squared, for example. So you can do that. Uh, we can compile uh, and run. And now we're getting 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared. We want to do a similar thing over here. So how about if I close that quote right here? And so what I want is i times i, not in quotes. Uh, I want Java to compute the value of the expression i times i. Uh, I'm putting it inside of parentheses. Turns out it doesn't have to be in parens, but it makes it very clear that it's that quantity, that value, you know, the i times the i that I wanna, I wanna be printing out. So the parentheses are not a bad idea and we use the string concatenation again. So now what I'm doing here inside the println is I'm concatenating three different things. I'm concatenating the value of the variable i, a, uh, a, a string constant that has some specific text to be printed next, and then we're asking Java to compute the value of i times i and concatenate that at the end. So three things, concatenated together into one string that gets printed. Uh, and I think you can probably see, I like to kind of make mistakes on purpose. You can, you know, you can have your predictions, but there's a, you know, there's a minor mistake that I've made in this line uh, uh, that we'll fix in a second. I kind of did it on purpose. 
So we have one squared is one, two squared is four, and so forth. I didn't put the space, you know. I did that on purpose, because I wanted to kind of just remind you about that. If you want a space here, you've got to include a space there. So we had to have a leading space and a trailing space. We had to be very precise about exactly what text we want it to be printing. So let me go ahead and compile this version of it. And now we've got a little for loop uh, that's printing those four lines. Uh, and that would replace what we had before, the four individual printlines. All right. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time um, uh, 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 showing you in more detail, because I think that it's worth it to kind of really carefully uh, uh, explain what's going on as this for loop is executing. I, I glossed over it before, kind of what, a, you know, this initialization, the test, and this update. I've mentioned to you that I'm not a, a big fan of slides, you know, so uh, uh, I don't tend to use slides a lot, but uh, I've been posting slides that my co-author, Marty Stepp, has put together. And every once in a while, there's a slide that I want to show you. So here's a slide that's from today's slide deck. And it's using this exact example, you know, the I squared, you know, I times I. Uh, and Marty here has identified as elements one, two, three, the initialization, the test, and the update. So you can kind of see all of those. And then number four is the body. And he's kind of put a five here next to that line of code that comes after the loop. So this is what we sometimes call a railroad diagram. It's a, it's a control flow diagram that explains kind of the order in which various things are done. So you can see that step one, the initialization, is done once and only once. We never come back to that. So we do the initialization once. And then we go into the loop. And the loop is really the kind of the, the central control of this loop is this test, i less than or equal to 4, the, this thing that's in the middle of, of uh, uh, the three things that we list there in the for loop. Now, you know, normally we read left to right, so you might kind of think that you do number 1, then you do number 2, then you do number 3, but you're going to see that that's not really what happens, that we kind of do a little weird turn here and do it in a slightly different order. So what we do is we... We perform the test, and we see whether the test evaluates to true or to false. Is the test true? If so, then we go into the body of the loop, and the next thing we do is execute the body. So we kind of make this turn here, that if the loop evaluates to true, then you go into the loop and you do the body, and only then do you come back and do the update. So it's in a slightly weird order, two and then four and then three. You do the test, the body, and then the update, and you come back. Test, body, update, you come back. Uh, test, body, update. I kind of will repeat that in my head when I'm thinking about for loops. Test, body, update, test, body, update, test, body, update. That's what the loop is doing. Eventually, we'd assume that this loop, uh, kind of the answer becomes no, the test isn't true anymore, and then we're done. We break out of the loop and we go to whatever came after the loop, in this case, the loop. Woo uh, message that Marty had included on the slide. So uh, I think this is worth watching. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to scooch this down a bit so we're not watching quite as much. I'm going to put these on separate lines. The initialization, the uh, test, uh, and the update. I'm going to put on different lines. And there's an option in JGRASP to view line numbers make it a little bit easier for me to talk about these different lines. Uh, and then the body will be here. So the initialization is on line 10, the test is on line 11, the update is on line 12, and the body is on line 13. Uh, what you might do, you know, play along at home, you know, one of the things that you could do while we're going through this example is if you try to kind of predict what's the next thing that, that uh, is going to get uh, the next line that we're going to go to as we execute the various uh, the, 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 the bits of code that are here. So I'm going to set a stop on this line. Remember, you can do that. You move over here, a little stop sign appears. Uh, so let me compile so Java knows about those changes. And then we'll do the debug option. So it stops right here. Notice nothing has happened yet. There's no local variables that are set up. I'm going to tell it to step. I'm going to give it that command in the JGRASS debugger to execute the initialization part. Uh, so well, let's just do that. So it does the initialization, and we see i brought into existence with a value of 1. 
we're not going to come back and execute that line 10 again. You know, initialization, initialization is done once. Now the control is all with this test. Uh, test body update. So it says, is this i of 1 less than or equal to 4? And the answer is yes. Uh, 1 is less than or equal to 4. So since it's true, we're going to go and execute the body. So we're going to skip from line 11 to line 13. You'll see that. We go to line 13. And now we're going to execute this line of code when i is a 1. So i is 1 here. 1 times 1 is 1. So the line of output that we get is 1 squared is 1 because that was what I was. Oh, and I should have asked you before I hit step. Uh, where does it go next? It goes to the update part. Test body update, test body update, test body update. So it goes to the update part where it's going to increment i by 1. Remember that this plus plus operator has the effect of incrementing i by 1. You can watch it here and see it change when I hit step. So i got incremented to be a 2. And we're back at the test. Is 2 less than or equal to 4? The answer is yes. So where does it go? Test body update. So it goes to the body in line 13, and now it's going to execute the println with an i of 2. So it's going to show 2 squared being 2 times 2, so it ends up printing out 2 squared is 4. Back to the update part in line 12, it's going to increment i again, so i is now 3. Uh, back to the test, is 3 less than or equal to 4? Yes, it is. So we go into the body in line 13. We print it out, interpreting it when an i is a 3, which gets us that line of output. Then we go to the update part. i gets updated to be a 4, and we're back to the test. 4 looks a lot like 4, but this test said less than or equal to. So it's going to go ahead and execute one more time, because 4 is less than or equal to 4. So it goes to the body in line 13, prints out that line of output, does an increment one more time, and i is now 5. So now i has become uh, big enough that it's no longer less than or equal to 4. So this is, gonna, this is the first time that our test is going to say, no, i is not less than or equal to 4. This is when we're going to say, all right, we're done with the loop, and then we're going to go to the line of code that comes afterwards, which is our line 15. So it's done with the loop here. Uh, it goes to line 15, and you may have noticed the variable i disappeared. So we're, we don't have that, ver that i variable anymore. Uh, it's, it's local to within of the for loop. Uh, so it goes away when the for loop is done executing. Um, that also means that we could have other for loops that use a variable i, and each one has its own variable i. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, okay, so that was what I wanted to do here. Let me go ahead and... Uh, undo that, uh, we can end this, this uh, debugging session. And let me go ahead and uh, put this back the way that it was before. Okay, so we'll do this i starting at 1, i less than or equal to 4, the i plus plus. Okay, uh, so what I wanted to do next is I wanted to mention something. So there's a lot of flexibility for what you would do for the initialization, what you would do for the test, what, what you would do for the update. For now, uh, we're going to do fairly simple for loops. We're not going to worry about trying to vary those things very much. We're going to want to be thinking about writing for loops that do things exactly n times for some value of n. And so if you start an i at 1 and you test while it's less than or equal to n and you do i++, plus plus, it's going to execute exactly n times. So when you know you want to do something some specific number of times, you write a for loop in this way. Um, the textbook mentions that there are some variations on this. So this is kind of the first of those patterns, where you started at 1, less than or equal to n, i++. Plus plus. Um, there's a common variation that a lot of programmers use, and we'll use this ourselves later in the quarter, uh, where we start i at 0 instead of starting it at 1. And then instead of saying less than or equal to, we do strictly less than. So that's kind of a variation. Some people like the zero-based loop. I mean, if you want to do a zero-based loop, you're welcome to do that. I think for novices, it's kind of nice to be able to begin with loops that start at one, you know, for now, and do the zero-based loops later. But it's totally up to you. If you, if you kind of, you know, either already know about zero-based loops or you want to start doing it early, it makes more sense, then you could do that. Just be careful not to mix them. You know, here it's strictly less than, here it's less than or equal to. And then there's a for loop here that shows you how to do something in a backwards way. So starting i at, at n, uh, uh, doing an i minus minus. So we decrement, we kind of i comes down, and we keep going as long as i is greater than or equal to 1. So 
So that's a pattern for kind of a backwards loop uh, that does things uh, in the backwards order. Um, I wanted to practice that backwards kind of loop for a little bit. Uh, I wanted us to write a loop that's going to create this as output. Uh, and that's going to lead to some other things that we want to talk about. So I'm going to have a for loop here. I'm going to say for int i equal uh, 10, because that's kind of my starting number. Remember that you know in that template it said to start at the n, to go while i is greater than or equal to 1, and an i minus 1. Minus. So while i is greater than or equal to 1, an i minus minus, uh, that's kind of following the template to, uh, to go from 10 down to 1. And uh, if I did system.out.println of i here, it would print out uh, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, et cetera, all on a different line, you know, because Printlin produces an entire line of output. So we need to do something different. So what we're going to do here, and this is going to be something we'll be exploring in other examples we do in a little bit in the lecture, and we're going to explore it even more on Wednesday. This is going to be something you're going to be using in your homework, is that we want to use a variation of the Printlin command known as print. And so there's going to be interesting combinations of print and Printlin in order to get just the right thing. So I'm going to go ahead and say print, you know, this i, and I'm going to compile, and I'm going to run. And what I got was 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then that's all folks. This is a little funny. How did that end up here, the that's all folks? Well, let's talk about that part first. So what happened there is I did all print commands. So the, the understanding of print is that it means that you print it on the current line and you stay on the current line. It's like if you were in an editor and you didn't hit the enter key, so you didn't go to the beginning of a new line. So when you're thinking about producing a line of output this way, you want to do a bunch of print commands, print, 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 all on the current line, but then you want to have a well-placed system.out.println with empty parentheses to complete the line of output. Now here, what we used a print lin with the empty parentheses for was to make a blank line. Here, what we're using it for is to complete a line. So if you've done a series of print commands, and then you have this print lin with the empty parens, it goes to the beginning of a new line. So that would complete the line of output. In fact, I even want to put in another one. I'm going to do system.out.println that actually does make a blank line to separate it from this line here. So if I compile uh, and run this version of it, you can see I've got the 10987654321, uh, so that's, that's sort of good. I mean, I've got part of what I wanted to have here, but I don't want 10, nine, I want those all scrunched together like that. I want to have them separated by commas. So this is going to be something where I don't print just the I, I'm going to have to concatenate a comma, and if I want a space, you can see there's spaces in there. If I want a space, I have to include that as well. So I'm going to include a comma and a space, you know, so that these things get spaced out. And now I've got them kind of on a line by themselves, which is good with the, with the comma space. Um, but I wanted to begin with some extra text and end with some extra text. And so uh, this is just kind of pointing out things like, uh, so where do I put the T minus? And I often will ask students, do I want to put the, the T minus here? No, if I put the T minus there, then every time through the loop it's going to do T minus. Uh, I want it to do the T minus only once. So I'm going to do a system.out.print command that does the T minus, and I'm going to do that before it goes into the for loop. Print means it'll be on the same line. Uh, and similarly, with the blast off, do I put it inside the loop? No, then it'll do it all 10 times. I want to do it after, so I can have a print command after. But I already have this print lin to complete the line of output. And Java lets me put the extra text there. So as you're completing this line of output, you can include a little bit of text that would be at the end of the line. So I want to print a little bit before, once, you know, then do the loop that does the 10 numbers, and then a little bit of text that it does once afterwards as it completes the line of output. And then we've got our T minus, you know, et cetera, blast off. Uh, as usual, I'm going to include all of this code uh, in uh, a file that I'll put on the calendar for today, so you'll have all of these examples. All right, uh, we have kind of just about enough time left 
to talk about another important concept. I'm going to talk about the idea of nested loops. And one of the things that we find, you know, this is true, I think, in mathematics and a lot of things. My guess is that the, the for loops are not going to be something that you struggle with all that much. A simple for loop is not going to be the, the big problem. You know, the syntax it takes some getting used to. You'll have to practice. You know, you'll make little mistakes here and there. You'll have to learn how to do it. But uh, I think that conceptually, simple for loops are not the big problem. The bigger problem is when we have a for loop inside a for loop. So that's when things get more tricky. And we're gonna, I'm going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about that. And then all of Wednesday's lecture, we're going to talk about nested loops, because that'll be the, the main thing you're practicing in your next homework. So let me uh, do something like what I did before. So suppose I had an integer i starting at 1, i less than or equal to 5, i plus plus. Suppose that I wanted to create five, I want to create a box that's got five rows of 10 stars, you know, kind of a solid box, five rows of 10 stars. Well, so five different times, I could do system.out.println of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 stars. Well, that would be a way to do it. Uh, let me compile and maybe I'll scooch up a little bit so we can see a little more output and we'll run it. And there's my box of 10 stars. Uh, how about if we put an extra blank line in there just to keep things uh, spaced out in the output here. So that's fine. It's got my box, you know, it's the five lines of 10 stars uh, uh, on a line. Um, we could do it that way, but this seems like a really, you know, uh, not a very flexible way to do it. I mean, what if you wanted 33 stars? You know, I have to keep typing stars and counting and so forth. What if you wanted to change the number of stars? Oh, I got to count and figure out just what to do. So this is a case where we want to use a for loop inside a for loop, okay? So uh, maybe I, uh, I didn't quite emphasize what I had done, what I mentioned, you know, when I first I was talking about the control statements. I've been indenting every time here to indicate that inside this for loop, this statement is inside the for loop, controlled by the for loop. That's why I've got extra indentation. We're gonna have even more indentation in here because we're gonna have some kind of a for loop here uh, that's gonna have its own text and then it's going to have something inside of it. You know, so there's going to be something here. So uh, you want to use the indentation here to indicate what's going on. The for loop is at the outer level of indentation, but it's controlling a statement, so we indent that controlled statement. And if that's also a for loop, we indent its controlled statement. All right, so how do we say to do something 10 times? We could say for, for int i equal 1, um, but we don't want to do that. You know, we were using i here, so we don't want to be using i here. The convention with nested loops is to tend to use i, j, k. You know, so uh, we had i for the outer loop, so we'll use j here instead. Int j is 1, j is less than or equal to 10, j plus plus. And so what is it that we want to do inside of here? I mean, what, I, what was I doing? I did star, 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 star. I counted 10 different times doing one star. So what I want here inside the loop is system.out.print one star. So uh, 10 times I print one star, and that's to get my line of 10 stars, and I do that uh, uh, for five different rows. So that's the idea. This isn't right, uh, but it's a good start. Uh, a for loop inside a for loop. Let's compile and run it. And what we get is not a box uh, you know, that's five rows of 10 stars, but a row of 50 stars, and our blank line is gone. That's kind of the blank line now is being used here. The thing is that we did print, 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 all sorts of print commands. So this inner loop here uh, is printing 10 stars on a line, and we did that five times with no print limit, no going to a new line. So it's five times 10, that's why we got 50 different stars. What we need is a println command with the empty parens. We've got to finish out our line of output, and the big question is where does it belong? So you could think you know, a little bit, where's just the right placement for that println? Um, if I do system.out.println here, you know, so suppose I do it after the print. So you could think about what you think that's going to do. So I compile and run. And what I get is a column of 50 stars. 
I get a column of 50 stars because it's doing a print followed by a print line. Star, new line, star, new line, star, new line. So we don't want it there. We currently have a print line here. You know, that's what we had before. After uh, this, you know, at the outermost level there, after that for loop, and that was creating the row of 50 stars. So that's not where we want the, the print line to go. This is kind of one of those <laughs> Goldilocks problems where, you know, uh, we're either getting too many print lines or too few print lines. We're trying to get just the right number of print lines. And it turns out that the place to put that is here. System.out.println uh, is the right place to do that. So what we want to do is we want to print out our 10 stars. And after the printi printing the 10 stars, we want to do one print line, empty print, kind of one return, one enter, go to the beginning of a new line. So that these lines together, this combination of the for loop with the print line with the empty prints, that combination is exactly equivalent to that print line that I have listed there. It has the same effect as that print line that I have that I commented out there. So let's go ahead and compile and run this version of it. And we're back to having uh, our five uh, rows of 10 stars and our blank line. You know, uh, now this print line here this is being used to make a blank line instead. So that's good. All right. Uh, I want to show some variations of this, some different kinds of loops. And as I said, we're going to spend uh, a lot of time in Wednesday's lecture talking about this. Let me make a copy of that loop that I just did before. Um, I don't need um, this comment here anymore because we're doing a different example. So I'll leave the one we had before, uh, but we're going to do a brand new one here. I wanted you to think about what would happen if instead of saying uh, j less than or equal to 10, what would happen if I said j less than or equal to i? So uh, in the inner for loop, what I do in this inner for loop is that I am testing the value uh, that's in the outer for loop. So, you know, basically, uh, oh, oh, and actually, uh, before we do that one, I wanted to do one other thing. I, 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 I forgot to do this, but let me do this here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up a stop. I just wanted to watch this a little bit, and then it'll make a little clearer what we're going to be doing in this example. So let me... Uh, compile and debug. And so let's watch here. Let's watch it a little bit, not a whole lot. Uh, but so it gets to the uh, that outer for loop, the int i for loop. I'm going to say step so that it sets up an i of 1. And 1 was less than or equal to 5, so we entered the loop. Now we're, we're hitting the for j loop. So when we execute this line of code, it sets up j also with a value of 1. So if you think about what's going to go on here, we're in this inner loop. So we're going to loop and loop and loop and loop. We're going to print a star, and then j is going to become 2. We're going to print a star, and j is going to become 3. So you can be watching j here. You can be watching the stars here. We're going to print a star, and j is going to become 4. Print a star, j becomes 5. Print a star, j becomes 6. Print a star, j becomes 7. Print a star, j becomes 8, j becomes 9, j becomes 10. And then the next time what ends up happening is uh, we don't, we're not seeing all the individual parts here, but j is going to be incremented to become an 11, and that's going to cause it to break out of this loop. So when I do a step, you know, it's going to increment that j to become, you know, it's going to become 11, that's going to be bigger, and so it breaks out. So, uh, and then it does the print line here, which is inside of the outer loop. It does one print line. Notice we've printed the 10 stars on a line, and we do one print line. It's like we hit enter. It's like we went to the beginning of the new line. Now we're finally back at the outer loop. I becomes 2, and we do the inner loop all over again. J is counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, printing of 10 stars. And then when it's finished printing those 10 stars, it does this, this simple print line here that completes the line of output. Watch it here. Watch it go to the beginning of a new line when it does that print line, beginning of the new line. We're back here. I becomes 3. So the inner loop is the one that executes you know, kind of quickly. We only go to the outer loop when we've finished that inner execution. Okay. I think we can get rid of that now. Maybe I'll... I'll stop viewing the line numbers. 
And let's come back to our little example here. So what's going to happen? So initially i is 1, and so it's going to execute this loop right here with i being 1. So how many stars is it going to print? I think it's going to print 1. And then it's going to come back around, i is going to become 2. How many stars will this loop print? i is now 2. It'll print 2 stars. And then when i becomes 3, it prints 3 stars. When i becomes 4, it prints 4 stars, and so on. So let me end the debug we were doing before, and we'll compile and run. So we still have our box that we had here, but this new code that I have prints a triangle. So by testing on i, instead of testing on, uh, using a specific number like 10, so instead of always making 10 stars, it's making i stars, and i is changing. That's why we get one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars. So that makes a triangle, you know, by setting that inner loop to be i. All right, let me make a copy of that code because I want to do some other examples. So let's make a copy of that and we'll come down here. Again, all these examples are going to be uh, in the, uh, on, on the calendar uh, in an example uh, that I do. So what if instead of printing stars, we printed I? So that's kind of an interesting possibility. So it's, we know that it's going to, the, the number of times it's going to do it is the triangle type formation. It's going to print something, one thing on the first line, two things on the next line, three things on the next line. But what's the thing it's going to print? Well, when i is 1, it's going to be printing 1s. When i is 2, it's going to be printing 2s. When i is 3, printing 3s, and so forth. So if we compile and run this little version, we have our, you know, our box, our triangle of stars, and now we've got a triangle of one, two, three, four, five, because it's, it's reporting to us what the value of i is as it does that. So we'll do one more little example here. Uh, and so let me paste in a copy of that code. What if we printed j? So instead of printing i, we print the j every time. Well, here, you know, i you know, for, for all of line three, I was three. So that's why we were getting all, you know, all threes being printed. Here, because we're printing J, remember J is the inner loop, the one that's going one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. So uh, it's going to be printing uh, a changing value of J as it prints the first thing, the second thing, the third thing, and so forth. So this one is an interesting one where on the third line it prints one, two, three, because J varied, you know, one and then two and then three. So instead of printing the i, which wasn't changing as the j loop was executing, we were printing the j itself. So those are all kind of very interesting variations. I think it's worth your time to make sure that you understand each of these different ones and why they do what they do, kind of why these different um, uh, versions do what they do. Okay, just a little bit left to do today. Let me go, this was all the way back to my original uh, printing of the box, you know, five rows of 10 stars. I wanted to mention uh, some potential errors you might make. What if in, instead of putting J here, you put I by accident? You know, you meant to do J, but you said I. What would happen to you? Well, let's try compiling and running and boy, there's stars, 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 stars. A lot of them. The, if, I, if I try scooching this thing over, there's tons of stars here. And look, look, I'm losing track. It's making even more stars. Uh, I'm going to have to end this. You know, there's an end command here. This is what's called an infinite loop. So what happened? I was set to 1. And then we've got a loop that's changing the value of j. And it's saying, is i less than or equal to 10? Well, it doesn't matter how big j gets i is still less than or equal to 10 because i is 1. So it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. So, you know, it shouldn't, you know, for loops shouldn't be creating infinite things, but that one did. Well, how, so I put it back to the j less than or equal to 10. What if you said i plus plus? You know, you incremented i instead of incrementing j. So we can compile and run that. You could kind of place your bets. What's going to happen? So instead of changing j, it changes i. But that means that j is always going to be this 1 that we initialized it to, and that's always less than or equal to 10. So it's another one of these infinite loops, another thing that goes on and on and on.
So I'll hit end. Uh, let me just mention an idea that I mentioned before, is that uh, psychologists talk about the idea of chunking, of grouping. And I think it's really important, you know, when we look at for loops, like if I'm looking at this for loop here, I kind of see here a body of a loop, you know, all of this code right here as being one thing, the body that's inside that outer for loop. So it's really important to kind of be looking for those structure elements. All right, we're at time, so that's uh, all for today. Uh, we'll do more next time.